Good morning. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 4, if you are not already there. John chapter 4, this is where we're going to be for our time together this morning. Uh, it's good to be back with all of you after uh, spiritually heavy seasons like Christmas or Easter or Vacation Bible School. I always find myself drained uh, physically, emotionally, spiritually, uh, and in need of refreshment. And so this past week, we, we took a week of holidays, we visited family, we took in some fun activities, uh, played some games, we rested. You know, these are things that kind of help me be refreshed. Maybe you have uh, similar ways of, of being refreshed. You know, maybe you're refreshed by relaxing in a hot tub. You know, maybe you're refreshed by playing or watching sports. Maybe you're refreshed by visiting with family or friends. Maybe you're refreshed by a delicious meal or beverage. Uh, maybe you're refreshed by curling up on the couch and reading a book. Now, when we are are physically or emotionally or spiritually drained. We like to do certain things or you know, maybe not do certain things to be refreshed. Now, as good as these times of refreshment are for us, and certainly they are beneficial, uh, they never last. At least I have found that they never they never last. Certainly they may refresh us for a time, but they do not ultimately satisfy the deepest longings of our soul. They do not ultimately quench our thirst for fulfillment. They may be good things, certainly they may be beneficial things, but they are not ultimate things. Despite our best efforts, we are constantly left with a sense of longing and dissatisfaction. Oh, we we came home from our week of holidays, and I felt like I needed a week from my week of holidays, if you know what I mean. Uh, but this is where this, this sense of longing and dissatisfaction in life, this is where our passage of Scripture for this morning meets us. In, in John chapter 4, Jesus encounters a Samaritan woman at a well, and he offers to quench her spiritual thirst forever. And, and just as Jesus met this woman in her thirst and, and offered her something beyond what she could have ever imagined, so also Jesus meets us in our times of deepest need, and he offers us something more than hot tubs, more than sports, more than fellowship, more than food, more than books. In this passage, we see that Jesus is offering us ultimate fulfillment through a relationship with him. And so if you have your Bibles open, I invite you to follow along with me as I read for us uh, John chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 1 to 15 this morning. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. 
Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. May God bless the reading of his word. In our text, we are reintroduced to a group of religious leaders called the Pharisees. Uh, The Pharisees were the ones who were interested in the work that John the Baptist was doing back in John chapter 1, and one of whom, that is Nicodemus, approached Jesus at night, and that was in uh, John chapter 3. But the Pharisees have since taken a greater interest in Jesus, and not only because uh, Jesus had recently cleansed the temple, which caused a a stir, certainly, back in in John chapter 2, but because Jesus was now gaining and baptizing more disciples than John the Baptist. And so Jesus is now the greater threat, and, and Jesus and his disciples, they decide in the, you know, in this immediate threat, they decide to head back to Galilee, which will be the center of Jesus' ministry for most of the next three years. Now, in order to go from Judea in the south up to Galilee in the north, uh, you, according to the text, had to pass through Samaria. Now, technically, if Jews didn't want to pass through Samaria, they could go Uh, the long way around, and we'll get into some of the reasons why that was the case. But Jesus decides to take the more direct route through Samaria, and not simply because it was the shorter route, uh, but because he had a more divine purpose, as we'll see in a minute. Uh, Jesus and his disciples, they come to a, a town in Samaria called Sychar. And there are two things that John, the gospel writer, wants us to know about this town. Number one, it was near the field that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. And number two, Jacob's well was there. Now, what's interesting about this is that uh, even though this well seems to be well known in the first century, the fact that you know Jesus and the Samaritan woman are, are talking about this well and, and its historicity, Uh, Nowhere in the Old Testament do we ever read of Jacob digging this said well. But we do know about this field. In Genesis chapter 33, verse 19, uh, Jacob bought uh, this piece of land from Hamor, that's Shechem's father. And it was this land that Joseph's bones were later laid to rest when the Israelites came up out of Egypt. That was in Joshua 24, verse 32. So we see this this piece of land, and certainly somewhere along the way, Jacob must have built this well. But the point in this text is that it's here at this well, on this field, where we see the humanity of Jesus. The humanity of Jesus. Verse 6, but Jesus... Wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. That is, it was about noon. Now, that's interesting considering the fact that, you know, we've, 
we've seen some significant things about Christ in the opening pages of John's Gospel. We've seen that he is the Word. We've seen that he was with God and is God. We've, we've seen that he is the only begotten Son of God. We've seen that he is light and life. We've seen that, that all things were made through him. And so for all that we've seen about Christ in the opening pages of John's Gospel, to now read that he was wearied is surprising to us. I mean, he's the Lord of all creation. How is he wearied? But that's, that's the mystery of the incarnation, is it not? That the word became flesh and dwelt among us, John 1 verse 14. Jesus is clearly more weary than his disciples because he, he doesn't accompany them into town to buy food, which is what we see them doing in verse 8. But how encouraging is it that, that Jesus knows what, it, what it's like to be drained and in need of refreshment? Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says that we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Right, so they, they've been walking for miles, it's the heat of the day, and Jesus is tired. I, I, I love the, the divinity of Jesus, the deity of Christ, but I love, too, the humanity of Jesus. It gives me such hope. I hope it does for you as well. So, so Jesus, in, in all his humanity, in all his weariness, he's at this well, on this field, and suddenly a woman comes to draw water at the same well. Now, now there is something very unusual about this woman. Two things, actually. First, she's coming to the well in the hottest part of the day. Normally, women who came to draw water would do so in the cool of the day, like in the morning or in the evening. Here she is coming at the hottest part of the day. But then the second thing that is unusual about her is that she is alone. Again, normally, women came to draw water together. For, for safety reasons, they would come as a, as a community to draw water. And so based on the fact that this woman is coming to the well alone in the heat of the day, we can assume that she is some kind of an outcast. Now, in verse 18, we read that uh, she has had five husbands, and that she is currently living with a man who is not her husband. And so we can see how she might be ostracized by the other women in the community. Yet notice who it is that initiates the conversation between Jesus and the Samaritan woman. In verse 7, Jesus says to her, give me a drink. Now, I understand that it's difficult for us to be shocked by stories in the Bible that we are familiar with, stories like this. But we need to try reading this story with fresh eyes because Jesus is very shocking here. Number one, Jesus is talking to a woman alone. Cultural implications there. Number two, he is talking to a Samaritan woman, and we'll get into that in a minute. And number three, he is talking to a woman at a well, which if you know your Bible, then you know that there are other well-known biblical incidents in which a man met a prospective bride at a well. Right? Abraham's servant 
met Rebekah on behalf of Isaac at a well in Genesis 24. Jacob met Rachel at a well in Genesis 29. Moses met Zipporah at a well in in Exodus chapter 2. According to biblical history, sketchy things happen at wells. (laughs) But Jesus doesn't seem to be bothered by any of that. There's a woman here, so he talks to her. In fact, what we see about Jesus is that he'll talk to anybody. In John chapter 3, Jesus just finished talking with Nicodemus. Right? Notice the contrast between these two, Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman. Nicodemus is a Jewish man. He's learned. He's respected in the community. And he comes to Jesus in the middle of the night. Here, on the other hand, is a, an unnamed Samaritan woman. She's presumed to not be learned. She's an outcast. And she comes to Jesus in the middle of the day. Yet, Jesus talks to both of them. And the lesson here for us is, are we willing to talk to anybody? Are we willing to talk to both those we agree with and those we disagree with? Both the religious and the outcast, both the churched and the unchurched, right? Jesus talked to anybody. Are we willing to do the same? Or, or do we have lists of people that we, we rather just steer clear from? The Samaritan woman is shocked. Not by Jesus' request to give him a drink, but by Jesus himself. In verse 9, she says to Jesus, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? And then John, the gospel writer, adds for us this little parenthetical note, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. We we have to understand that there was a, a long and ongoing history of animosity between Jews and Samaritans. In the 8th century BC, when the northern kingdom of Israel fell to the Assyrians, the majority of the population was carried off into exile. And to repopulate the area, the Assyrians brought in peoples from uh, other parts of their empire to, uh, to intermarry with those who were still left in the land. And this resulted in a mixed race of peoples later known as the Samaritans. So that's, that's their history. Well, in the 6th century BC, the southern kingdom of Judah was overrun by the Babylonians, and many of their peoples were also taken away into exile in Babylon. Later, the Babylonian kingdom was conquered by the Persians, and it was uh, Cyrus, the king of Persia, who allowed exiles from Judah to return to, to Jerusalem. And they started to rebuild the temple and later repair the walls of Jerusalem. And those returning to rebuild were called Jews. So there's the history of of the Jews. Well, the Samaritans, they offered to assist the Jews in rebuilding the temple, but uh, their offer was rejected. The Jews regarded the Samaritans as, say, ethnically impure. They were considered half-breeds, part Jewish and part something else. And in the Following centuries, there was much hatred between Jews and Samaritans. In uh, 128 BC, the Jews destroyed the Samaritans' rival temple that they had built on Mount Gerizim in Samaria. Uh, Between 86 and 9, so a few decades before this conversation between Jesus and the Samaritan woman, Uh, Samaritans had defiled the Jerusalem temple during Passover by scattering dead men's bones in it. In AD 52, pilgrims from Galilee traveling through Samaria en route to Jerusalem were massacred by Samaritans. Uh, Jewish rabbis said, Let no man eat the bread of the Samaritans, for he who eats their bread is as he who eats swine's flesh. Know anything about the Jews? They do not eat swine's flesh. A popular prayer in those days said, 
And Lord, do not remember the Samaritans in the resurrection. <laughs> like we're, we're, we're talking about serious animosity. And so the Samaritan woman, she seems to think that Jesus doesn't know who he is. You know, you're a Jewish man asking for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman. You, you clearly don't know who you are. But really, it's she who doesn't know who Jesus is. Because by asking for a drink, Jesus is breaking down the long-standing barrier between Jews and Samaritans. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. It says that there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Uh, Ephesians 2, verse 14, says that Jesus is our peace, who has made us both one, right? Us both, Jews, Samaritans, one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Right? Jesus may come across as a weary and thirsty traveler, but he is revealing to her and to us that he's the only one who can quench the deepest longings of our souls. Regardless of our gender, regardless of our age or ethnicity or socioeconomic status, Revelation 3, no, sorry, Revelation 5 verse 9 says, Worthy are you, speaking about Christ, to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God. Yet this, from every tribe and language and people and nation. I would say that, yes, Jesus knows who he is. And I think the Samaritan woman is just understanding now who she is face to face with. In verse 10, Jesus says to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. All right, I love this because Jesus is either an egomaniac or he is the Christ that this woman has been longing for her whole life. Right, if you only knew who you're speaking to, who talks like that? Right, if you only knew, if you only knew who I am, if you only knew what I can give you, if you only knew the gift of God, then you would have living water. It would be yours if you only knew. Now, this is the, the only place in the Gospels where uh, this Greek word for gift, dorea, is used. And it says gift of God. If you knew the gift of God is the only place in the Gospels where, where that Greek word is used. It's used four times, though, in the book of Acts. And always in reference to the gift of the Holy Spirit. In other words, Jesus is saying, nothing will ever satisfy your longing and dissatisfaction except for a long and continuous drink of God the Holy Spirit. In, uh, in John chapter 7, verses 37 to 38, Jesus is going to say, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Uh, God is often described as the source of living water in the Old Testament. <clears throat> Excuse me. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13 says, My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they've hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that 
can hold no water. Uh, Psalm 36, verse 9. For with you is the fountain of life. Psalm 42, verses 1 to 2. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. And then one more, Isaiah 44, verse 3. For I will pour, uh, for I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. All right, so there's all of these, these allusions to what Jesus is saying here about if you only knew the gift of God. Really, if you only knew God, if you only knew who was speaking to you. But the thing is that the Samaritan woman wouldn't have picked up on all these allusions because her Bible only contained the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And yet, what Nicodemus taught us back in John chapter 3 is that even those who know their Bible, like front to back, had trouble comprehending the deeper spiritual realities into which Jesus was leading them. <laughs> and so just like Nicodemus, the Samaritan woman, she fails to understand what Jesus is offering her. In verses 11 to 12, she says to Jesus, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? And she adds, are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. So she, she's reminding Jesus that the well is deep and that he has nothing with which to, to draw water. In other words, it's impossible for Jesus to give her this living water that he's promising. But as we've seen thus far in the Gospel of John, nothing is impossible with God. Right? Jesus is not only greater than Jacob. Like Colossians 1, verses 15 to 16, paints a glorious picture of Christ. It says he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things, including Jacob, were created through Christ and for Christ. Jacob's very existence is owing to Christ. So yes, Jesus is greater than Jacob. He's his creator after all. And thus, the living water Jesus is offering is no ordinary water. In verses 13 to 14, Jesus says to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, according to the Jacob's well. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. All right, that's superior water. Uh, we have um, we have one of those water containers with a Brita filter in it, and uh, and sometimes I've offered people like when they come over to our house, I've offered people you know water from this Brita filter, and uh, and they're content to just drink water from the tap, and I mean that's that's your prerogative if, if that's if that's fine with you, but I'm I'm thinking to myself, we have superior tasting cold water. In the fridge. Like, I can get that for you. It's, it's not far. Just open the fridge, pour it into a glass. We're good. You know, you don't have to go to the tap. Why would you do that? But isn't this what we so often do when we see fulfillment and satisfaction from anything or anyone other than Christ? Right? If I could just have that job or if I could just get married, or if I could just have children, or if I could just go on a vacation, or if I could just retire, then I would be happy. That's not how it works. That's drinking from water that will only leave you thirsty. 
Abd er-Rahman III of Spain, in 960 AD, said this, I have now reigned above 50 years in victory or peace, beloved by my subjects, dreaded by my enemies, and respected by my allies. Riches and honors, power and pleasure have waited on my call, nor does any earthly blessing appear to have been wanting to my felicity. In this situation, I have diligently numbered the days of pure and genuine happiness which have fallen to my lot, and they amount to 14. O oh man, place not thy confidence in this present world. Fourteen days out of fifty years. But we do this. We try to quench our thirst with all, all manner of things. Companionship, sexual intimacy, materialism, personal achievements, and a whole ocean full of things of this world and we remain parched. We're always looking for something to quench our thirst. When we're young children, we think that that life will be made when we're teenagers. And when we're teenagers, we think that our life will be made when we can drive. And when we can drive, we think that our life will be made when we graduate. And when we're in college, we think that our life will be made when we're married. And when we're married, we think that our life will be made when we have children. And when those children leave home, we think that our life will be made when we retire. And when we're on our deathbed, we realize that we have spent our whole lives perpetually thirsty and that all we needed was to believe in Jesus who said, whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. Church, if we only knew the gift of God, never be thirsty. Now, now Jesus isn't necessarily saying that, that, that we'll never spiritually hunger or thirst again. You know, Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for, for they shall be satisfied. We, we should be hungry and thirsty for more and more and more of God. What Jesus is saying is that, that for those who have believed in Jesus, we have within us a supply of water that will never run dry. We have access to, to living water that will never run out. When we, we are, when we are drained and in need of refreshment, we may find temporary satisfaction in the things we find refreshing, but true and lasting satisfaction can only be found in the person of Jesus Christ. In verse 14, Jesus says to the Samaritan woman, the water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Right, Jesus isn't, we, we must have said, Jesus isn't offering her water from Jacob's well. He, he's not even offering her Brita filtered water. No, Jesus is offering her abundant life in him. Right, he's offering her living water that will quench her spiritual thirst forever. Revelation 7. Verse 17 says this, For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Right, doesn't that sound blissful? Right, it's because it is. When we believe in Jesus, our, our empty and parched lives are suddenly filled with living water that springs up within us and continues right on into eternity. It doesn't end. Now the thing is this, this Samaritan woman, she has, she has nothing to offer Jesus in return, right? 
He is just totally morally bankrupt. Right, but Jesus, Jesus isn't after anything in return. You know, this living water, it's a gift. It's a gift that Jesus Christ is ready to give all those who come to him in faith. The same offer that Jesus made to the Samaritan woman is the same offer he's making to you and me today. We can be forgiven. We can have purpose and meaning. We, we can have eternal life. We can have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in us. The, the free gift of salvation can be ours. The question is, are we thirsty? Are we thirsty? When, when pastor and author uh, Stuart Briscoe was at Cape and Ray Bible School, he and his wife uh, were separated from each other for a day. Uh, he had left her the car, but he had accidentally taken the keys with him. And so after a couple of hours, uh, Jill, his wife, borrowed another car, and as she was driving down the road, she saw some girls hitchhiking. So she picked them up, and they turned out to be three German girls visiting England. And she managed to persuade these girls to come with her to a conference for German Christian young people. And one of them was marvelously saved there. Here is that girl's story. She was a theological student in Germany. Uh, she had come under the influence of some teaching that, instead of leading her to an intelligent worship of God, had filled her with much doubt and confusion. She had delivered an ultimatum to the God whose existence she doubted. She told God that if he was there, he would show himself to her in some way. He must do this within three months. If he didn't, she told him, I'll quit my schooling, quit theology, quit religion, and I think I'm going to quit living because there's nothing to live for. After explaining this, she turned to Stuart's wife and with great emotion said, the three months end today. Here was a girl who was thirsty and in need of refreshment that only Jesus can provide. Are we thirsty? Are we drained and in need of refreshment? Have the good things we've pursued in this life satisfied us for a moment and then vanished? Have we found that, that nothing and no one in this world can satisfy the deepest longings of our soul? When we reach the end of our hoarded resources, the hymn writer says, our Father's full giving has only begun. Are we thirsty? Because if so, we need to come to Jesus with the same desire as this Samaritan woman. In verse 15, you know what she says? You can read it, verse 15. Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. If you're here this morning and you're thirsty for something more than what this world has given you thus far, then come to Jesus and he will give you living water. He will give you abundant life. He will give you his holy Spirit, and you will never be thirsty again. In John 6, verse 37, Jesus said, Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. All right, if that was true for the Samaritan woman, then you better believe that it will be true for you and me and anyone who puts their trust in Jesus Christ. Are we thirsty? 
And may we come to the only one who can satisfy the deepest longings of our soul. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your Son, for the gift of your Holy Spirit, for the gift of forgiveness for sinners, for the gift of eternal life for all who believe, for the gift of purpose and, and meaning and satisfaction in you. What a gift we have received from your hand. This is only possible through the power of your Holy Spirit and the living water that Christ brings. Satisfy us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.